We're continuing our series called City Lights Manifesto. And so if you're new with us uh, over the next number of weeks, and last week we started this series based on our values, and then also we're talking about our identity. And so this morning we're going to spend some time talking about our identity as a church And some of you might know our mission statement. We talked about it yesterday as part of uh, our partnership rally. Does anybody know our our mission statement, our identity statement? We are a Jesus-centered family of sent servants. Can you say that with me? We are a Jesus-centered family of sent servants. Not too complex, right? And this morning, I I thought we'd hone in on this uh, piece of our identity that beginning part of what does it mean to be Jesus-centered. Think how important your identity actually is. Uh, Even just recently, if you had to go to a restaurant, or maybe still, uh, you need your vaccine passport, but you also need this thing probably in your wallet, your ID. Who are you? When you pull out your ID, we often know who we are, right? I don't know how many of you know who Peter Parker is. He's a bit of a mystery, that man, right? If you're into Spider-Man, he's also Spider-Man. Most of you know Spider-Man, but I I feel like Peter Parker struggles maybe like some of us struggle. Uh, He wants to be a superhero, but yet also really wants to fit in. He wants to belong. He wants to be loved by Mary Jane, of course. Uh, But there are difficulties with our image that that speak into our identity, I don't know about this morning, but as you might have got up and looked in the mirror, uh, you might have said something to yourself as you looked in the mirror. I won't ask you what you said, but for myself, I'm like, oh, I looked a bit tired. Looked more bagged than I thought. Uh, Maybe maybe some of others of you looked in your mirror and you're like, wow, I am good looking. (laughs) Well, maybe you are. That's fantastic, right? Uh, Even last night, I I was looking at myself probably too closely, and I I yelled out to Naomi, who was in the other room, I've got more gray hair than I can imagine. Naomi just shook her head. Um, Now, I I don't want to speak too much of our outward image, but that influences, of course, our own identity. Throughout my life, I have always wished I would be a bit more muscular I remember years ago, somebody telling me, Paul, you have such bony knees. <laughs> of all things, right? But it's, it still kind of cycles in my head sometimes that my identity is, my image is based around my look of my knees. I've worn baggy pants so you can't see how bony they are this morning. <sighs> I'm joking, but not really. The, uh, the issue is often we think either too highly of ourselves or too little of ourselves. Author Eric Erickson says, in the social juggle of human existence, there is no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity. Really, we all long for a sense of identity. Some of us would say by wearing masks, we don't get to reveal our true identity. So we do have some deep and justified concerns about what does it mean to have an identity. And I would argue, once we have faith in Jesus, that definitely influences our identity. Jesus speaks a lot into our identity. Think of that phrase about our identity, Jesus-centered family. That's all about identity. And so here's my main point this morning, if you're taking notes or if you just have a great memory. As a follower of Jesus, your identity stems from your belief about how God sees you. Your identity stems from your belief about how God sees you. Another way to put this is, do you grasp how God sees you? Do you really get it in how he views you? Maybe one other way of thinking about it is this question as of how do you view yourself, maybe you can think of that right now, maybe a snapshot or some words come up, and then think of that gap of how God views you. How big is the gap? Or maybe you're brand new to Christianity, to the biblical story of God and his viewpoint of us as people, as followers of Jesus. You might say, I I don't know if the gap's that small. Or maybe it's, I don't even know what that gap should be. 
But as I've thought about this topic this past week and kind of uh, done a lot of reading scripture and prayer and thinking about it, I, I really sense the opportunity for us to hear these incredible words of life this morning. Why don't we pray for a moment? God, in this moment of silence, we want to be still and know that you are God. And if you are God, we also ask you then to speak truth, to speak life, to speak clarity and hope into our identity. Speak, Holy Spirit, into those depths of areas that we are afraid to let go of that have shaped us, that have formed us. And may we hear your word over us today. In your name, amen. So I'd love to hear from you for a moment. What are the different ways our identity can be shaped? How can your identity be shaped? How how are us as a people get our identity be, be shaped in the world? Parents, yeah, totally. How else? What we watch. What we watch, yeah. <laughs> TikTok or TV, Netflix or Amazon Prime. What we take in, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Or more garbage. <laughs> Who, we Who we hang out with. Yeah, that's huge. Hobbies? Hobbies? hobbies. Yes, hobbies. <laughs> Love some of Matthew's hobbies. Career. Career. Totally. Yeah, who you, what your dreams, your aspirations. Any other ways? Your identity is shaped. Our Sorry, I still can't. Our belief. Beliefs. Beliefs. Yes, totally. Of course. Yeah, that's kind of the foundation. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there are so many things that shape our identity. Nobody said this one, but how about money? Right? If you have lots of it, shapes your identity. If you don't have any of it, or seemingly not enough, how about family? I think, right? Our, our history of our family, uh, current culture might say your feelings. Whatever you feel, that's going to shape your identity, your sexuality, your gender. This past week, I uh, uh, came upon a book by uh, a guy named Klein Snodgrass. Now, don't judge him. Uh, We're talking about identity here, but he has written a phenomenal book, and uh, I'm just looking for the title here. I did write it down, but now I can't see it. Uh, Who God Says You Are. There it is, right in front of me. Who God Says You Are. And he comes up with nine different areas. I'll just say them really quickly, but uh, worth the five bucks on Kindle. Uh, He says, we're influenced in our identity by our appearance, by history, by relation, by basically relationships, Uh, your mind, commitment, actions... Your boundaries, process of changes, and your future. That was a big list, I admit. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. But honestly, our identity is shaped in so many different ways. So I ask you, as I've been asking myself, who will define your identity? Who will define your identity? Will you allow God to recreate your identity? It's really the big question this morning. We heard uh, Daniel read. If you have your Bibles, turn to that passage again. 2 Corinthians 5. uh, We'll look exactly at 17. I think page 966 in uh, the Bible that might be on a chair around you. Page 966. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but actually pretty amazing and miraculous. So we have been given a new identity in Christ. New identity. Think of all the people who get a new identity throughout Scripture. There's numerous, right? I think of the person who has the same name as me, Saul to Paul, gets a transformed identity pretty quickly in Christ. Others come to mind? Anybody... Throw out some names. Who? 
Moses, yes. Abraham, Abraham. yeah. Jacob. Jacob, any ladies that we can think of? <laughs> Sarah. Sarah, yeah, wow. Uh, right, there, there are so many. I mean, even think of Mary, Jesus' mother, right? What, what a transform in identity as she uh, gets to bear Jesus, but also just her life. Uh, Peter, we could talk about him in a moment. Yeah, wow. His identity gets changed and challenged in a number of ways. Uh, But in approaching Jesus in relationship, we get offered a new identity. It's it's not like, I don't have my phone here, but it's it's not like we just download another app for Jesus, kind of add him onto the list of things that we have in our life. Some of us, I I would admit, we often treat Jesus like that, that he's a spiritual go-to, right? Oh, I got something. Oh, I heard about, you know, financial difficulty, relational problems, uh, cancer. I'll go to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I I got something for you now, right? He's not that turned to. If we look back to 2 Corinthians 5.17, it actually says, you have been given a new identity. You become a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, or look, the new has come. Think of what it said back in Jeremiah. You're given a new heart, a heart of flesh, a heart transplant. We get a new identity in Christ. Look back at that verse. It says you're a new creation. What do you leave behind when you become a new creation in Christ? What what do you think? Love some feedback here. What do you leave behind when you become a new creation in Christ? What do you leave behind? What's Selfish desires. That pretty wraps up a a lot of them. (laughs) Thanks for taking the best answer. No, that's not the best, but what else do we leave behind? Your old wardrobe. Your old wardrobe. (laughs) Okay, yeah, new robes in Christ. Okay, I see where you're going. Clothed with Christ, thank you. Not my baggy jeans, okay. What else do we leave behind? Anybody else over here? Old Old habits, yeah. Yeah. Now imagine if everybody uh, believed in Jesus and you get to, if you have your Bibles open, you could flip over, but Colossians 3.10 says this, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed after the image of its creator. Colossians 3.10, you have been renewed, being renewed after the image of its creator. Whoo! Does that ring true back to Genesis 1.27? Some of you know that passage, which talks about God creating man and woman in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. Each of you, each of us, is made in the image of God, yet, of course, sin, our brokenness, our family history, our image of ourselves, all these different lists of things distort us as image bearers of God. And yet, The promise in Christ is says, you put on the new self, you put on Christ, you become in Christ, which is being renewed after the image of its creator, that is God. And what a change. I don't know if you have friends who aren't believers, I'm sure you do. You know people at work that aren't believers in Jesus, and sometimes they might think of, well, what does it mean? Like, I know I have a lot of fun right now on the weekends, or, uh, you know, I get lots into this or that. So if I follow Jesus, is it like a whole bunch of rules and it's super boring? No. Think of the new life we have in Christ, freedom, hope. Think of the opportunities for truth. Uh, I just think about in a few days from now, we start filing our taxes. How many of us will be tempted to cheat on our taxes? Me, right? You don't have to raise your hand, right? You don't have to laugh at me, Josh. But uh, honestly, right, there is a temptation. Well, this is just cash, right? This is like, no, I don't, I don't need to. No, Jesus says you've put on a new self. You have a new identity. As you declare in your taxes, truthfully, you're trusting Christ. It's a declaration throughout the heavenly realms to say, I trust Christ. And so we have this new identity. There's so many core areas. I could go on for quite a while, but you are a beloved child of God. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You're lavished with love. 
Brendan Manning says this, being the beloved is our identity, the core of our existence. So Jesus redeems you. He takes our sinfulness. He wipes it clean. And through his offer, and then in exchange our repentance, we have this new life. We have this new identity in Christ. And so being Jesus-centered is meaning we are in Christ. We are all about Christ. Our identity is focused on him. And so as you start to understand how God sees you, how he has made you in Christ, that gap can start to lessen. Because having that identity in Christ actually changes everything. Remember that huge list of nine different things we talked about that I can barely remember? I'll touch on a few of them. I'll talk for a moment, first of all, on your body, your image of yourself. Again, currently in culture, you think of the millions and millions of dollars Peloton has spent and has made. Their stock has skyrocketed. What? Based on image, right? If you just work out like this, think of the business model, how gyms have said, we can charge people a membership. Well, does it matter how much they come? No, no. We'll just charge them a monthly membership, and some of them won't even come. What? They're going to pay money even if they don't come? Oh, yes. Phenomenal, right? Based on this view of ourselves. Unfortunately, too, the, the view of our image gets mixed up so often. Currently, in our, in our culture around sexuality, around gender, around who we are as a person. But I like what Klein Snodgrass says, if we are created in the image of God, we are not the origin of our own existence. We cannot explain ourselves, and we are not the ultimate source of our own identity. We are the result of an action by another. Our identity is a gift of grace, and we mirror and point to another. Wow. Wow. That's not what you're going to hear when you turn on your TV, when you turn on your radio on your drive home. It's not what you're going to hear when you look at TikTok or you look at Instagram. No, it's the opposite message there. So saying the more likes you have, the more followers you have, the more views you have, that's your identity. And no, the message of this new identity is saying we are actually under the authority of God. We are under his protection, his covering, because he is the one. The other is the one that defines us. Listen to these words for a moment. And I might even speak your name, but imagine this. Can you accept these, that you are God's workmanship? Formed for a purpose. You are deeply loved. You are known by God. You are unique and chosen by God. Can you accept those? Maybe some of you are like, oh yeah, I've heard that before. It's not about hearing, but it is about believing. Can you believe? That's how God sees you. And it doesn't mean that those are easy things to believe. As we get our instructions of how to live and how to view our bodies, of how to view our self. And I I would say it is a, a, a bigger holistic understanding of self that God says, yes, I have made your physical body, but I've also made your heart, your soul. And so both matter, but we don't overemphasize our physical. But we give thanks for what we can do physically, but also then we place more emphasis on how God wants to transform us from the inside out. So that's our body. Next, our relationships. As we understand our identity, our relationships start to change. Our relationships start to adjust. Why? Because I think growing up, all of us know the impact of our parents. Right? Some of you have incredible parents speaking life and encouragement. But most of us can think of, if it's not our parents, maybe someone else who hasn't been there for us 
or left, or there was a divorce, or there was abuse. There was something that unfortunately framed our point of reference of ourselves again in such a negative way. And along comes God and who says, if you believe in Jesus, as it says in John 1.13, you become part of the family of God. You become a child. Shalea, you become a daughter. Donna, you become a daughter. Chris, you become a son of God. Matthew, you become a son. You each have a new brother in Christ. It is a bit bizarre to say. I was saying that this morning. Can you believe it? If God is our father, Christ is our brother. Some of you be like, I'm not a really great sibling. <laughs> to Christ, right? Whew, right? But the beauty then of what we're welcomed into is phenomenal, especially for me. I'm an only child. I'm like, whoa, I've got a phenomenal extended family. Some of you get that, right? If you're an only child or maybe you don't like your siblings, right? You're like, I can't wait to have a better extended family. Uh, don't nod if that's you, if you have siblings in the room. Uh, but really, joking aside, right, there is a call, an invitation to have a new spiritual family. A family that goes back to Abraham, goes back to Joseph, to Ruth, to Naomi, that we are now connected to these Saints, these followers of God, these who had struggles too, who had ups and downs, but God is overarching. We are now part of this greater, bigger narrative. And again, I would admit that's pretty humbling because uh, we all want to fit in, right? We all want to belong. Some of you are brand new this morning, or maybe you've been here a few weeks now, part of City Lights on a Sunday morning, but uh, I, I'm, eight, I was going to say I'm 86. No, I'm 46. <laughs> Whew, I've really aged well. Uh, <laughs> I'm 46, but I, I don't care where I hang out. I still want to fit in, right? We want to fit in, whether it's your workplace, whether it's a neighborhood, the sports team that you join, whoever you're just hanging out for dinner, you want to fit in. You want to feel like you belong. And the beauty of a spiritual family is, says, doesn't matter, male or female, slave or free. Doesn't matter of how much money is in your bank account, single or married. Doesn't matter, divorced, separated, had an abortion or had a miscarriage or never had kids. God says you are welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome to be part of my family. I'll say one more and then ask for some input for a moment. History. Again, how do you handle your history? How do you view your history? Many of us can think of someone who spoke pain over us, words of hurt over us. But also just uh, history. Some things that happened for us in high school we can't forget. Things we happened growing up that we were like, oh, that just wouldn't have happened. Super painful things. And yet, God speaks life. Our new identity speaks life. Lucy in the Peanuts cartoon once was thrown the ball by Charlie, uh, Charlie Brown, and she didn't catch the fly ball, and she said, the past got in my eyes. Some of you got that that are a little bit older. <laughs> Thank you. The past gets in our eyes sometimes, right? You, you're maybe just meeting with someone. They're like, hey, hey, are you there? And you're like, oh, sorry. I was thinking about something that just happened. Right? <laughs> it happens to me often, right? We, we, we get off track. But the beauty of not only a new spiritual family, but also history is now we're grafted in to Christ. We are welcomed into Christ's family, but also into his story, into a relationship that's based on faith that we say, wow, what a grander narrative that I now get to be a part of. Now, again, this is really a little different than cultural, and I'll ask for a second, but actually, why don't I ask now? Why is that so different than what culture is saying? 
You can be part of a grand narrative. What is culture saying currently to us? You have your narrative. What does that look like? You have your narrative. Yeah, write your own story. Write your own story? Yeah, what else? You are the director, the screenwriter, the hero. <laughs> Nuver works in uh, film. He gets that. Telling people stories. Anybody else? Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Yeah. You are part of a grander narrative. Why is that difficult then? I am not the director, nor the hero. And what kind of feelings then come, come to mind? humbling, right? To lay down. What does Jesus say? Lay, lay down your life. I've laid down my life. Take up the cross. And so I was, I was reading an interesting idea and concept, the beauty of worship, of gathering together to sing songs, to read scripture, is actually focused on history, on remembering and naming what God has done in the past and banking life on the significance of those past events, such as Jesus' real life, his real birth, his real perfect life, his real death, his real resurrection. But also lamenting about events in the past. We don't, like, super downplay those. Those are painful, right? Some of those things that have happened to us. But also reminding ourselves what we should and should not do, and that this world is not as it should be. As I've met with some people, uh, I just say in the end, this world's broken. War going on, it's, it's a broken world. Do we expect any less? Pandemic, it's a broken world. Like, should we be surprised, really? I don't think so. Sin invades every aspect of who we are as humanity. And it is only, again, that gap that we are called into relationship with Christ and then to continue to lessen that gap as we allow that identity to influence us. A few more. Future. Future. Our ident identity impacts the future. Right? So often right now, I think our future can be just like, oh, when's the pandemic going to be over? Oh, can't wait to take off those masks. Sorry, I got to take off mine right now. Uh, but right? When can we take our masks off? I saw it this morning. Alberta, headlines, masks can be taken off indoors. And people are like, really? Can I, can I move there? No, right? It's like, okay, right? We can get through this. But the future, for others, it's like, oh, when can I? I just can't wait for that vacation, or I can't wait for retirement, or I can't wait for like just a perfect family situation, or I can't wait for that, that awesome job that I'm going to have, or, or fit into my, you know, the, the network that I want to fit into. But Christ says, no, I've given you a future. Your identity then is based on future with me. Holy Spirit in you now, giving you power to live out that verse, that verse which says this, the riches of this glorious mystery, glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do we think that, Jamie, that you have Christ in you, the hope of glory? Ooh, Preston, did you get up this morning? All right, putting on my clothes. I've got Christ in me this morning. The hope of glory. Wow, right? It's one thing to put on a mask, but imagine if our mask, as you're putting it on in the inside and the outside, says Christ in you, right? Or you're eating, remember alphabet soup? But uh, I ate cherries this morning, but imagine like each one said Christ in you, and you're like, yes, Christ in me, right? We almost need those reminders. I'm a vessel of Christ. Christ in me, the hope, though, of what is to come. Because, yes, we live in a broken world. The hope of being with Christ one day. And I remember uh, one author, I think it was John Piper, he said, like, would we be excited if we get to heaven and Jesus is the only one there? Would we be ecstatic? Or would we be like, oh, where's my grandma? Right? Or, or where's, where's my my?" My loved one. Oh, just, just Jesus? Right? It, when I read that, I was like, ooh, ooh, that's a bit, throws me off a bit. Because where is our true hope found? The invitation, again, 
If we have new life in Christ, we want to be with Christ. We want to celebrate Christ. Being Jesus-centered is all-encompassing. So if our identity has changed in so many ways, wrap up here soon, but we, we all have a new way of living. We have a new way of living, right? We're putting on Christ. We're a Jesus-centered family of sent servants. And uh, I like what this quote says, you cannot be without doing. You cannot be without doing. And so if we know all these real realities of our new identity, then suddenly we're going to act differently. Many of you heard the story this past week of the 13 soldiers in Ukraine on this island. I think they call it Snake Island. Maybe it's a uh, translation, but the, the Russian army pulled up to this island and asked them to surrender. And uh, these Ukrainian soldiers who knew their identity, who knew who they were, they're loyal, loyal to Ukraine. They uh, very clearly said, not a chance. I won't say what I think they said. Some of you have heard that uh, transcript. They did not surrender. And for you and me, as we accept this new identity, culture is going to continue to push you. Remember, Pastor Brett's a great analogy of that salmon swimming upstream, right? That's really what it feels like. It's one thing to give an extreme example of somebody holding a gun to our head. But it's a whole nother that just continues to push us downstream away from this calling of our identity and this new identity. If you have your Bibles open, look at to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20 once more. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20 says this, All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors. What does ambassador do? Somebody tell me really quick. Represents. Represents. Yes, thank you. Represents, right? If you're an ambassador from Canada and you travel somewhere, you're representing Canada. Again, did you think this morning when you got up, wow, or do you think on Friday when you went to work or when you went to school, I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm an ambassador for Christ. We don't just wave a flag, maybe in protest of culture around us or things that we don't like people doing. No, we come as sent servants, as Daniel talked about last week, we come ready to wash people's feet. I'm not saying actually asking people to take off their shoes, but humbly serving like Jesus. Humbly coming with love, radically caring for others. Matthew 5, 13 and 14 says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Think about that for a moment. To be sent servants, we need to be changed. We need to be transformed. We need to realize what a drastic change this is going to be and how much our heart needs to be in this change. I'm going to ask you to... Uh, have a quick discussion, turn around to three or four people around you, and answer the question, and even on uh, Zoom, we'll just do a, a quick little breakout. Answer the question, why is believing in your identity in Christ foundational to whether you share about Christ? So why do you first need to believe in your identity in Christ before you're actually going to share about Christ? Or maybe you think it's not that foundational. Is it foundational? Turn to someone if you feel comfortable right now to answer that question. Why is belief in your identity in Christ? So even in twos and threes, if you're here by yourself and you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. But just take a moment, share with somebody quickly. Why do you think it's important to, share, to know your identity in Christ before you're able to share about Christ? Ready, go.
What did you get? No, there has to be a root. Ah, the root. Oh. Thirty more seconds. That's great. What is the difference? Anybody here? Why why do we need that identity be secure in Christ first? What did what do you hear? Somebody from your group? I'll leave some of those who have shared multiple times. <laughs> Try to get some others. <laughs> Donna, did you have a good? Yes. Yes, yes. I don't know if you heard that, but inviting you into something versus trying to convert somebody. You got a whole bunch of rules. Yes, the gospel has transformed us. Anybody else? Why do you need that core identity in Christ? You said something, uh, one of you. Yes. Yes, a gift. Thanks, Pearl. And uh, in the group there, congruency, I think, was the word. Or la we don't want to be an imposter, right? And I think that's the tension in Christianity because some of us maybe have felt, well, I just got to be a, I got to go tell somebody. I got to invite somebody to this event. But meanwhile, our heart is distant from God. And, and uh, right, I mean, we need to know who we are in Christ. We need to remember the depth of who we are. I'll tell one quick story that I think might uh, hit home well. There was once uh, a farmer who walked through a field and found a, a wounded eagle. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but fits the point well. He brought it home, this eagle, and brought it to where their chicken pen was. And so the eagle started healing up, but started eating the chicken food along with the chickens. You can guess where this is go, going, but one day a bird trainer showed up and saw this eagle and asked the farmer, what in the world, why are you doing with this eagle? He said, well, it goes injured and I took care of it. Well, no, it should be out of his cage. It should be flying. It should be soaring. The farmer's like, well, well, good luck. And so that bird trainer actually took the bird out and said, come on, fly. And the bird just kind of hopped off and walked back <laughs> to the chicken coop. And the bird trainer was beside himself and said, no, no, this, this isn't right. And so started thinking through and started coming there uh, numerous days to the farmer's place and, and started doing exercises with the eagle and saying that the heart of an eagle is to soar. The heart of an eagle is to live out in nature. And so the farmer gave him more and more leeway. And finally, this bird trainer brought the eagle to a high mountain and said, come on, bird. And with much trembling, jumped off 
of the trainer's hand, feebly started to fly and eventually soared. And I know there's a call in each one of your hearts to soar in Christ. That God knows what you're struggling with, where you see that chicken food and says, oh, God, it's so much easier to go back to that bed. But Christ calls us to soar. Again, not for our glory. Not so people see us soaring around in work or in family or in relationship. But that we are ambassadors wearing the flag of Christ, the peace of Christ in such a time as this, right? Where we have neighbors, we literally have neighbors who are from Russia on our street. But you have co-workers and friends who are struggling with what's going on overseas. What a time is this to soar and to share the hope. Or even just to say in your staff room this week or to a staff, well, can I pray? Like, I don't know what's going on over there. Can I just pray for us for, for peace? Wow, what transformation could happen? Oh, well, we've never done that before. God will give you opportunity as you step out in boldness, as you listen to the Holy Spirit, as you enjoy that risk and that call. And so this morning, I'm going to invite up the music team. Why don't we stand as we're going to respond. And as we often respond, uh, each and every week, there's the opportunity to uh, receive communion together. And communion, again, is, is one of those greatest opportunities uh, week by week for us to remind ourselves of who we are in who? Christ. In Christ. Communion is about saying to myself, it's about saying again to God, and it's about even saying to the, the heavenly realms, to these demonic forces and voices and ideas, I belong to Christ. I'm secure in Christ. I'm going to soar in Christ this week. I might be feeble. I might feel like I'm failing. I might say stupid things to people that I need to ask forgiveness for. But I need to be in Christ. And so my invitation, as I was thinking a bit earlier, is um, Pastor Brett has encouraged us in this before, but I'd actually encourage you all the more. As we sing these next couple songs, um, there's an opportunity first... uh, to confess, to say, God, just in our hearts as we're singing these songs, God, I I haven't been all in you. The gap has been too large to come and then come and grab one of the communion elements. And then as you're holding it, maybe that group that you were uh, sharing with before, or maybe someone beside you or somebody as you look across that's standing by themselves that has a communion element, to go and remind them of how they are in Christ. As you take that wafer to say, this is Christ's body, symbolically, but powerfully given for your life. This is the juice that represents Christ's blood to offer you forgiveness from all of your sins. Let us receive together and respond to who we truly are.